Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Gender 101, hosted by Hub Cymru Africa and SSAP. I am Faith Israel. Um, I work with SSAP, which is a diaspora-led organisation um, which works to add value to the global solidarity sector in Wales. And SAP is also part of Hub Cymru Africa, or HCA, which is a Welsh government funded programme uh, made up of four other partners, um, including Fair Trade Wales, Wales Africa Health Links Network, and WCIA. And HCA supports uh, the international development sector in Wales via training and development support. Um, so this meeting uh, is a meeting style format, so that means you will have access to your own mics, but please, if you could all keep your mics muted throughout the event, um, we would really appreciate that. Um, please feel free to contribute to the discussion um, by using the chat function um, and ask questions um, in the chat. Um, we would love to see a really lively chat um, going on. Um, there will be time at the end for these questions to be answered. Um, so please, if there is anything uh, burning on your mind or anything that comes up, please, please, please feel free to use the chat function. Um, and we also really value uh, feedback. So at the end, there will be a survey that will be shared. Um, if you could please uh, complete this, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, and finally, this is a safe space for racialized and minoritized people. So any form of abuse will not be tolerated. Um, and while we encourage uh, challenging and constructive conversations, uh, people's lived experiences are not up for debate. So please respect all speakers and participants. Um, any form of abuse, again, will uh, not be tolerated. So please be mindful. Um, uh, I would like to now pass on to our amazing speakers uh, to introduce themselves. Linda, if you would like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm Linda Devo. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm full of cold, so please excuse me if I disappear every now and then to blow my nose or something. I woke up ill this morning. Um, to introduce myself, so what do I say? I'm 52. I am a practicing artist. I am a recently uh, self-retired from school state school education as a teacher after 17 years I am a co-founder of Kiki Bristol which is an organization for Q2Pop people in Bristol um, as well as being a member of uh, Queer Vision which is Bristol Pride's film festival arm though I've just recently or I'm actually in the process of leaving Bristol so I've, I've recently begun moving to Blackpool which is where I'm sitting now in my enormous dusty mansion <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that'll do for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, see if you would like to introduce yourself as well. Hi, uh, uh, hi everyone. My name is Z, pronouns they, she. Um, I work uh, for an LGBT organization called Stonewall, uh, where I create training sessions on LGBT inclusion in the workplace. Um, I want to say my gay job and my gay job, because I do not have a day job. My day job is my gay job um is also uh, being part of speaking engagements where we talk about lgbt inclusion specifically um and i am very much open about you know uh my life and i talk about very much about the intersectionality of being a black woman and non-binary i wrote an article about that as well um but really diving into the understanding of gender um from a decolonial ancestral point of view uh, which i'm really interested in um, and I found myself many times uh, questioning and unlearning and relearning. Um, so yeah, I hope that this conversation that we will be having with you is going to be good and hopefully, you know, expand uh, different perspectives as well from your end. Um, so yeah, that's all about me. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, to start off this conversation, I would like to ask you both, uh, what is gender? Um, just to begin. Should I start or should you, we yeah, want to start? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it depends on, of course, the, the definition that we all have um, that is very, very well known. Um, but gender is really much about the identity that you give yourself. Um, it is not, it is often people assume 
gender and sex are same, but they are not. The sex is assigned at birth. Gender is very much how you identify yourself as you grow, and it has an impact on the external and the internal factors, i.e. external, societal, cultural, religious, et cetera, et cetera. And then internal is how you feel and how you move within the world. Um, so that's kind of like really quickly um, what what uh, gender is from my perspective, uh, Linda. Um, I pretty much agree with that. It's uh, different to sex, which is what we're assigned by whoever extracts us from our, our birth canal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're all assigned something at birth. I saw this brilliant cartoon and it was way ahead of its time. It was in 1980 something in the Sun newspaper of all things. And it had a little tiny clip of a baby being who'd been born and the parents asked the doctor, is it a boy or girl? And the doctor replied, it hasn't told us yet, which was really ahead of ahead of its time, I thought. Um, uh, so yeah, so sex is is one thing, is what we're assigned and genders, what we, uh, you know, how we express, how we internally feel and how we express ourselves and how we're read by society. So there's sort of societal, cultural, um, yeah, reads really, and expression. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, and it constantly want... evolves as well. Is the other thing. This yeah. is what I, yeah I wanted to continue with that. Like a culture, exactly. I think um, for me specifically, I was raised in, and that's what a lot of parents did, or or at least my parents uh, did. But they tried to move to a better, better place, a better, better area. Uh, of course, that was back in the Netherlands. So I'm from the Netherlands. Um, and that automatically means going to a white space, right? So I think my identity also formed um, through that understanding um, and developed through what I see growing up in a very diverse, and when I say diverse, it mainly is non-white, but also working class, because that is also something, um, to a white, still middle class, um, place and that also like influenced the way I saw myself and how sort of we could talk about the understanding of the perception of beauty right specifically towards women the perception of um, you know as a black person specifically how that went and I think my parents did a really good job still in making sure that we went back to you know, the city as often as we could. Um, but it, de it definitely did change my perspective and I think influenced me um, in ways that my parents also weren't aware of that it actually influenced me and that kind of like how it affected also my gender because I was like, what? why are girls like this? <laughs> and why are boys like this? And why can I not be both? And I, I, had to, I definitely had that understanding. Um, although I didn't have the words for it, I definitely felt that understanding, I guess. Uh, how was that for you, though? Uh, the... Yeah, I, I was born in the UK, but adopted by Ghanaian parents and brought up in Ghana. And uh, I was allowed to basically be, I was a free range kid. I was just out with yeah. my dogs. I was quite isolated. I was an only child. So other than at school, I was just out with my dogs and buried in a book or up a tree. And there was no kind of conversation around gender or sex, really. Mm -hmm. Other than my mum trying to put me in dresses, which from dot every picture of me with a dress on I look upset because they did not feel right for my body I, I felt restricted and you know like I was being made to be something that didn't feel right to me um and then it was only as I started to you know um I basically hit adolescence and puberty that it became an issue because then people started to look at me differently to how I felt in myself and that quite that felt like very restrictive, you know, suddenly I was being put in some sort of box, which I, I railed against. And I came back to the UK when I was 12. And then issues of sexuality had sort of started to crop their heads uh, up around when I was about 10. So that kind of confused the issue a bit, you know. So I was read as a tomboy because I was so, you know, kind of allowed to be so physically in myself. And I, I kind of pushed off all the attempts to feminize me. Um, so, so yeah, I was read as, you know, a tomboy mm. and then add to that feeling some attraction towards, um, girls mm. kind of, it all got a bit confused around being around when I was a teenager, I was very confused. And I think, um, 
yeah, I'd be, it'd be very interesting if I was a young person now, what, what would have happened with that? Because I know I certainly did not enjoy being a female, didn't want right. any of the heterosexual male attention that was sent my way. I didn't want it. And so I hid any, as much as possible, hid any physical appearance of being female. Yeah. As much as I could. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if I've gone off, off piece. I, no, that is, I, it resonates with me. I had exactly the same. I think, and it was also a change because I've been thinking a lot and I think in the last couple of years on how the impact of society, parental dynamics, uh, you know, the family dynamics mm. influence um, the way I move through the world. Um, so like I said, you know, very much white centered, uh, well, until I was eight years old, I, I was allowed to be whatever I wanted to be. I was very tomboyish as well. Uh, but I didn't mind clothes at all. Like it, I did not mind if they put me in a dress. I did not mind if they put me in pants. I didn't, I didn't mind it. Right. Um, I mean, of course, during those times, those leggings were really annoying because they would always itch. But besides that, I was just like I even in a dress, I would just climb a tree. Right. It wasn't about look, for me, it didn't matter. And I think the moment that that started to change was around the time where, of course, you know, 11 and 12, 13, those are the moments uh, and I think in hindsight, that is also where definitely the fear of the parents came in. For me, they understood, you know, you are dark skinned, you are a black woman, right? The woman comes that comes into play. And I think um, they really tried to protect me because they knew that it was a white space, but I'm also just, again, what, you know, a woman as well. Um, so just making sure that, you know, the understanding of racism, how that influenced, I was not adhering to the gender binary as well, but I did what I, what I best did to please the parents as well. And, you know, so that is the moment where I really started to, um, to, um, have difficulties. Um, I also didn't really like wearing very, you know, tight things, but again, um that was I did sometimes I didn't really think about that and sports I think was my safe haven uh I played tennis which even though they put me in the skirts and all those things and you know I was playing part of I was part of team uh, teams as well um I didn't mind it because if I'm running down and up and down the court it doesn't matter how I look if I sweat I sweat I you know so there was a moment that I was like great I don't have to be part of this. I, I can just move my body the way I wanted to. But then I think the biggest thing was the development of breasts. That was for me a difficult challenge. That was a challenge um, because I was like, why is it grow? Why is it growing so fast? <laughs> and why is it there? And why does it in the why it's in the middle of it? It's what you know, and of course, especially um, you know, um in 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 where I was raised, you are you should be very proud of what you have been given because hey, other people don't have it. So be proud of that your body is working, all those things. And now, you know, now, now that I'm in my thirties, I'm like, yes, I am very proud, but sometimes God gives you a bit too much. So we can adapt it a little bit, right? So it's like changing and having the dialogue with yourself about, you know, sometimes you have been given a bit too much. Sometimes it's a bit, a bit of an overflow. Um, but I think for me, that is, you know, puberty is of course where, where that, that changes. And I think especially in these last couple of years, I've also really been thinking, and there was a moment in my in my youth that I thought that I was the wrong sex, even though I wasn't, right? But I would question things like, why are boys um, going to the toilet this way? Why is it hanging out? Why do I, I not have it? Why do I, you know, all those things. Um, and I think for me, now slowly understanding um, uh, there's an amazing documentary by that talks about the life of Pauli Murray I don't know if people have uh, read that documentary amazing individual Pauli Murray sorry the life of sorry say again Pauli Murray and um, they are a non-binary I mean if we look at the gender inclusive language now they would have been a non-binary individual the reason why I say that is because they were desperately looking for testosterone during those times, right? And this is well documented and people can find it on Amazon uh, Prime, I think. 
Um, and Polly Murray was a, a beyond brilliant individual who actually influenced the uh, writings of Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Gator, I can, I can never get the, the name right. Um, but that was something of the writing that, that Polly Murray um, uh, played a big role in, right? And that is women's equality. This was a mixed race, black or mixed race person um, who changed the the way the world was viewing women, but this person in general was desperately looking for testosterone, right? And through their language, through their understanding of who they were, and also understanding, you know, maybe they are insects or not, I actually started to understand myself as well. So it's really truly the stories of other people that I found myself. And I think that is so such an important and vital thing to get these stories out um, as well. Sure. Um, when we're talking about when we're talking about uh, about that, um, there was another because I'm also very much aware about the topics. There was another question that says your journey with gender as Black people within the UK. You said that you moved when you were 12. Mm -hmm. How was? How yeah. Was that? So so essentially for me, when um, I, I fought my way through through secondary school and puberty, trying to you know desperately trying to make sense of you know, where I fit in, and you know, similar, similarly to you, interestingly, because you grew up in a white space, I grew up in a black space, I'm clearly of mixed heritage, <clears throat> but I wasn't told I was adopted till I finally asked my mum, you know, I had all sorts of ideas about why I was brown and everyone else was black in the family, but um, to, you know, aside from that, I, you know, I, I clearly was different to everybody in my family, so I felt wrong, kind of, not wrong, but you know, I felt different and like an other, and I came to this country in 1982, very racist London uh, and that was that racism was from I say racism is actually the wrong word it's prejudice I got um, you know a, a insulted and abused by my fellow students whether they're black brown or white because I was African mm, and then yeah because of the sexuality thing you know I was like I was going out with boys and trying to be straight but I was clearly yeah. knew I was not you know I, my my sexuality was a bit more colorful than that and then, so finally at 16, I just, I came out, I, th I thought, that's it, I'm a lesbian, I went into the lesbian community, didn't quite fit in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, then, yeah. And, then, and then I found my, you know, I started a photography project because I was like, you know, where, who, who, yeah, there must be some black people. people. What do black lesbians look like? Who are yeah. they? Who are these people? Yeah. So I started a photography project, hanging out with some young black lesbians at the time who all became very, um, you know, they were very politicized. I started, um, you know, kind of changing their names to African names and reclaiming their Africanness. Fantastic. But then they started dissing white people and I'm clearly of mixed heritage. So I felt really uncomfortable there. That's oh my right. God. In the end, I just stopped trying to find any yeah. <laughs> tribe to fit in and yeah. concentrated on fitting in myself. Mm. So, so the um, internal validation there. Because well, because I'm I'm the constant in all of this. Yeah. I was the constant. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I very by the time I sort of hit 19 or whatever, and I started, I discovered clubbing with gay boys, which is the place I felt most at home because they didn't seem to care what, yeah. you know, so long as we we're having a nice time on the dance floor, they didn't you know, there was no time for the kind of politics was about you celebrating. And and yeah. that's where I felt most at home. And that's kind of held mm -hmm. as a, a true for me all the way. Through, that is where Kiki now and that scene that makes me feel yeah that's that's the place where it seems like and I know that's not uh it's not by any means completely trouble free because prejudice exists exists everywhere unfortunately it seems like part of humanity's journey and the whole business of patriarch and capitalism means that we're always looking for division when that, whereas actually the things that make us different are things that should be celebrated yeah. but that's often not the case so um I don't know what your question was. I'm sorry, I've lost. <laughs> no, it was just <laughs> like moment. just explaining your journey with gender yeah. as as a black individual. But of course, like from your uh, yeah your perspective, that was of course mixed race, um, and you had to dive into. I mean, I I think what my conclusion is at the age where I'm at now is that all of the things that made you know all all the different facets of us as human beings make us rich and really interesting so I you know I, I, this is almost like a benefit for me that I've been a maverick on every in every possible position that I was in yeah I wasn't I didn't quite fit so I, ha yeah. I had to work really hard to really embrace my own self 
and it yeah. holds me really good stead now because I literally can go anywhere and I'm not uh, well yes I, I could probably say safely say I could go anywhere and feel at home in myself and because mm. that's what I hold the space I hold I'm often yeah I often don't have the kind of struggles that 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 I think I might have had when I was younger with identity because I, I yeah. know who I am now in relation to other people uh yeah anyway I'm rambling yeah no 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 I mean it totally making sense um I'm just thinking about like reflecting on my own because I do feel that I am I am getting there it can be it can get better let's just put it that way so I think because there was such an emphasis emphasis on fitting in and belonging um but what you know at one point i started thinking what does that mean if that means losing parts of myself hmm. then what is the point there right and i've been really thinking and thinking in these last couple of months thinking a lot about internal validation versus external validation in relations to specifically trans individuals um and the discussion around um who is allowed to get gender affirming surgery and who is allowed to not get gender affirming surgery or need to go via the route of the doctor to get it or you know have been going on the waiting list and all those things and i've been trying to really make sense uh, and i saw this there were two uh, separate um research that found that when it comes to trans individuals because a lot of people the first thing that they say is like well you're going to mutilate your body or you're going to mutilate your you mut mutilate your body, um, or you're going to you know harm yourself. And I'm always like, but if we look at the statistics, sixty percent of people who uh, have cosmetic surgery, and these are often then cisgender, I will put them under the term cisgender, uh, have cosmetic surgery, they regret versus one. 0.1% of trans individuals that regret it. So when you know, and when I'm I was thinking about these statistics i was like wait are we doing that are people like um regretting it because they were looking for an external validation i.e another person deciding who they had to be you know society um you know all these elements of not fitting in and just trying to like what you said you know trying to fit in trying to belong etc cetera, etc cetera. or and, or it was an internal validation and was that internal validation then um you know allowing themselves also to have gender affirming surgery because for me cosmetic surgery and what they call for the trans individuals gender affirming surgery i feel that both is gender affirming surgery but it depends on how you look at it is it for them or is it for you or is it for you know is there is there a caveat you know and i've been thinking a lot about that but in these last three years especially um allowing myself to come you know the way i come as in the way that I move and make sense of my body, especially the gender fluidity that I that I live in, um, it is it's been very interesting of how society impacts um, the respect that you give yourself, also, and how mm -hmm. the society impacts uh, the love that you give yourself, right? Uh, and a lot of people come from this perspective of we need to. Uh, you know, make sure that our kids are this and this and that and that. Uh, we need to allow them to be whoever they want to be. And then I'm like, but when we include trans individuals, even intersex individuals, no, sorry, there's only a line that you can choose. Even if you're intersex, what are you going to be? Right. And I'm like, whoa, that doesn't make any sense if you're gender fluid, what's going to be. So I've been thinking, you know, and so for me, you know, to hear where you are, I'm like, how do I get there faster? Is it really about, is it about me, you know, fully getting the, the acceptance, the internal validation that I need, which I'm definitely on the road trip to, or is it more of like, like, do I need to unlearn a lot more, right? And specifically for me, because you, of course, were, you came to the UK, I was born in the Netherlands, I was born within the rigid understanding of the binary, I was born oh. within the rigid understanding of, of whiteness and blackness, right so it's just like is that because you know so it's it's really interesting i mean for me i'm just like saying what what comes up um but that is kind of like it's really interesting of like how can we make sure that people actually get there faster that it doesn't take all these years or all these experiences maybe like thinking about less traumatic experiences to get there 
Um, those are the things that I'm thinking about, at least. You've said a lot of really interesting things. That <laughs> I know, I know. I know, because this is what my brain does every day. It's like, why are we the way that is, you know? It's so, so the point is, like, you, you said about growing up in the Netherlands and it being a very, uh, uh, you didn't use those words, but sort of heteronormative. I must say, I grew up in, in West Africa and Ghana. Very much the same. You know, it was um, very much, it's a very Christian, you know, there's obviously the sort of traditional um, culture, but on top of that, a sort of over overlaid on that is this Christian. But uh, Christianity comes from. Colonized stuff that's been. Yeah, exactly. And taken on like so deeply that, you know, there wasn't much space for any gender fluidity, fluidity and that obviously Ghana, like Ghana is one of the countries that's going through massive um, turmoil at the moment with the yeah. LGBTQ um, agenda, you know, that, not agenda, but that sort of uh, fundamentalist Christian agenda being being used to try to control and, um, de- and criminalize the LGBTQ population. So that, that, that's still ongoing. I think that, that the, the, the sort of uh, rhetorics of colonization and religion uh, uh, often create a lot of a lot of the issues that we then and conditioning that we then have to untangle and grow through coupled with you know the the, the kind of awkwardness that happens for most people as they're going through puberty actually yeah you know, like I don't think I know anybody who was you know who just felt perfectly like you know transitioned perfectly from being a carefree yeah. prepubescent child through puberty into adulthood with no issues around yeah you know, but those things are of course like part of growing up and I'm always thinking you have the part of growing up that is normal and then you have the part of what is expected of you to do from the society it's the conditioning. It's all the conditioning yeah and those are the things government. that I'm thinking about yeah but you have to try and navigate your own stuff and and it would be really great if we could have a society where people are encouraged to to understand that life is a lot more than a black and white binary thing you know life is full of wonderful expressions of variety why is it that humans are expected to be this or that you know yeah. heterosexual or you know what I mean it's like everything is yeah. black and white and it's just not like that no um as for speeding up the process to get into the point where I'm at you know I think it's a very much as a it, there, there's a societal thing and these sort of conversations are really great for you know the conversation's great that's going on generally and I wish actually what I would like to see more of is more dialogue between people mm. who aren't necessarily on the same side you know because I feel like we're probably very much chiming with each other's yeah kind of journeys and stuff and I would really be um, very interested in having dialogue with people who, who who don't have those views to to, to tr- try and help them get past it because I don't think that kind of prison serves anybody really you know no. it's very smug yeah. if you're born into a cis you're a cisgender yeah. This sexual whatever you know yeah. you know you're you're born in the so-called norm mm. good for you what about everybody yeah. else so I, I kind of want to challenge those people and, and shake them up a bit and, and and get them to question you know like why why you know and yeah. that conversation is happening more and more which is a really really great thing I think yeah I think I mean that's I've been thinking a lot. process for everybody yeah I've been thinking a lot I was part of this mental health training um and there was a couple of months back and it was really interesting because they create they um, had an overview of the mental health crisis because currently there is a lot of mental health crisis due to the um, oh trigger warning I'm going to be talking about uh, mental health and uh, uh, in that specific thing and specifically focused on not so I'm going to say anything negative or super intense but I do want to make that clear um, but there was a uh, mental health uh, overview and report or specifically that the crisis is around cisgender men. Of course, we do not know what their sexuality is, but cisgender men just in general. And um, that there's a, you know, a heightened um, uh, issue of people unaliving themselves uh, because they cannot simply handle the, the pressure. And f- they were looking at different aspects of why that is, the way that is. And you know, for me, it dived into the patriarchy. It dived into what is expected of them, right? Mm. It dived into what we see now. I, I recently posted, um, um, I recently posted a uh, thing on Instagram regarding the Lil Nas X now being mm. nominated, 
uh, for BET, and it dives into the understanding of femininity and what is allowed, what are men allowed and not allowed to do when it comes to feeling their emotions and feeling centering themselves. And I really, you know, that research was so interesting and that training session was so interesting because it was like, wait, they, they, they have problems with expressing themselves um, because it is very much a, a very difficult um, moment to, um, to be in for also a cisgender individual. But if they are not able to, to express themselves and they are also not allowed to express themselves because only true masculinity will they get respect and i.e. validation, Mm. then of course you're going to strip your femininity from you. And when I say femininity, that is, of course, the assumption that, that those are soft things, vulnerability, emotions, da, 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 which aren't, is not soft. It's the most toughest thing that you have to do. Um, but I've been really thinking a lot about that where, you know, a lot of people are like trying to hold on to that masculinity and I'm like, yeah, but you're, it's, it's, oh. it's killing people. So why are you holding on to it? Because I'm like, gender fluidity allows me to move. And this is this is how I breathe. Why you want to take away my breath whilst you're also also clinging onto your own? You know, it's it's very it was a very fear. interesting it's fear. People, people, yeah. I think people generally feel threatened and and there's a, a herd, there's a bit of herd mentality. People like, you know, just as I tried desperately to fit in when I was a teenager, because we want the safety of being in community, and that's why. So many of us have to go and create our own communities because when you find you don't fit in this, that, any other space, you have to create your own space. Yeah. And, and we're very fortunate that we're in a position to be able to do that because yeah. you, you know, we, we, we do need community. We do need to be with each other. Mm. Um, but I think it's because of fear. People, if, you, if you're stripping away what's, what, what we believe to be the, the, the way and you're stripping that away, people yeah. are threatening. Yeah, if, it is a threat. If you question thing. that, then you have to question everything. Yeah. Actually, because if yeah. the whole of patriarchy is built on male dominance, this is what it is to be masculine, this is what it is to be feminine, mm. and you're undermining that, mm. then that questions everything. It throws everything up. Yeah. I think that's why people have such strong, violent reactions to anything. Yeah, especially that word, violence. Yeah, it's a violent reaction that people have. Um, but yeah, I also think about time. There was a question on, uh, let's see... Oh, wait. So I'm, I'm just going to erase the question oh, just to, because you guys are, I could literally listen to you guys talk mm -hmm. all day, all day. Um, but I do want to ask you both, um, given the experiences that you've both discussed, um, both personally and generally more anecdotally, um, how do you see spaces becoming more gender inclusive um, Firstly, like wisely um, in society generally, but also within um, this community of global solidarity and development. How do you see spaces just becoming more gender inclusive um, with all the different gender identities that exist? I mean, there are myriad ways. It starts. It starts with policy. Yeah, really boring kind of policies you know, kind of making it, stating it very clearly, just as we did at the start of this conversation, what kind of conversation we're going to have, what sort of dialogue, how people are expected to comport themselves in a space. It starts with asking, you know, understand that the understanding that every person, even though we're all humans and we all have that in common, it's everyone's right to be able to express themselves. So allowing and inviting people to, to say who they are rather than, you know, those awful forms that are, ask you if you're, Black Caribbean, Black African, you know, uh, you know. You that know that there is never a question of are you white, European, white? Ar like there is no. I, it's hilarious. I always I look at that. that and like, for you, what you're allowed to be, I generally cross those out and go other because because you know because I've been othered so much. I own the othered. I yeah, own it. I you know, it. So, but less less about me. So yeah, that's that's two of the things I can think of um, off the top of my head. You know, looking at how how people hire also, you know, sort of hiring policies, making sure if you want diversity, one's gonna to have to go out and actively approach the communities that you want to see represented in your workforce. Mm. Or yeah. your audiences when you're putting theater plays on or exhibitions or whatever. 
who, yeah. you know, kind of curating what it is you want to see. You have to actively make a choice about yeah. going community to five people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, it is always the people that make the business. It is not, it's not a business that, I mean, we're changing that now. AI becomes more part of it, but it's still like influenced by individuals, right? So I think, yeah, like what you said, policies is where it starts. And I think um, there was a really interesting research that I did, a report that I did uh, on the importance of um, inclusion. Um, and I was speaking to a trans individual who um, was applying for this role um, and he was um, going to transition whilst he was in the job. And I think it was so interesting to see um, that he specifically looked at his at, at the policy of the organization before he applied, uh, got the job um, and saw that they had a real or sorry, and before that saw that they had a really good sick leave for for individuals. Um, so he applied, got the job. And then went on sick leave to get his gender affirming surgery done. Um, and he dealt with a manager or his manager who was asking him the whole time, why are you on leave? Why are you on leave? Why are you on leave? But you should, first of all, not ask. Um, and I asked him the question if that if it was a trans inclusive policy, uh, specifically focused on on um, taking leave for either gender affirming surgery or any type of um, gender affirming care, uh, if he would have taken that. And he was like, yeah, without a doubt, I would have taken it because it eliminates that coming out in, in the job. It eliminates, it elevates that feeling of, oh, I am safe, I'm here. I, they understand that people who experience the world differently exist they want me for my intelligence. They want me for what I bring to the table. They want me for that. They do not want, to, the way I, I move in it only can you know create a different perspective that I bring. They want to further develop the organization um, with you know the help that I can bring. And I think when I learned about that, the importance of policy there, um, the importance of, of, and that is pretty much where it starts, um, it just, it, it opened my eyes as well, because of course, I get tell, tell to a lot of people, you know, trans inclusive policies are important, but having that first person perspective that, that he was able to give me, um, that shows really the importance. Um, and I always try to share this as much as I can, because this is a story of a person who, um, who took time off, but had to go and around and find a way to, to, you know, get gender affirming surgery. And then the manager comes in and asks inappropriate questions of why you're on sick leave. No, you're not allowed to ask that. It's sickly, right? So you're still dealing with people who are being intrusive in your in your world. Um, so I think that is where policies are such a, a vital thing. Um, and from there on, you know, I think specifically when it comes to um, showing that you are, I mean, it's Pride Month now, uh, showing that you are supporting the community. Um, what we see, unfortunately, is pride, you know, the logos, they are there, we see you, we, I, I, we see you, okay, that's the first things first, we see you. Um, secondly, as long as your um, policies do not match the logo, people are not going to work for you. And I don't think people really have a full understanding of that, um, where it is really focused on, on the policies that you represent. If a person is going to apply, just like I said the, about the experience of the, per, of the individual who went um, and he checked the policies before he applied, um, these things, these are the things that we figured out, right? Um, and like I mentioned, I work for an LGBT organization and just to talk about intersectionality here, um, even though it is an LGBT organization, I also had to look at the race perspective. And I think a lot of people do not understand how these intersectionalities actually um, you know, uh, um, allow me to, or not allow me to move within the space. So when I apply for specifically this role at the LGBT organization, I spoke to people who were black and brown. I literally invited them to have a conversation with me. It's like, okay, great on the, the sex and gender, sexuality and gender, but what about race? Like how, how are, just be honest and open, right? So when it comes to these intersectionalities, I have to dive into different different parts of myself and see and move through that lens because that is a lens that other people put on me. So I have to move with that, right? I'm not allowed to move just freely and just apply for it. And that is such a, 
vital and, and, and you know, that's a privilege that I think a lot of people are not thinking about. So every place that I go, I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm also neurodivergent, just to add that in. Do they have, you know, uh, policies or do they have specifically care for people who are neurodivergent? Is there flexible working? Next, what is their race um, policies? Do they have specifically mental health focused uh, policies that dive into black lives or non-white individuals when something like, you know, the Black Lives Matter had a very impact, a big impact on black individuals. And then I have to look into specifically trans individual policies. Um, what kind of support do you give there, right? What about sick leave? What if I want to start a family? How does that go? This is just one individual, this is me. And I'm already thinking about all of these things, right? So how I move within the world and also how I obtain capital, how I am allowed to get a house, that all depends on, that can't, you know, that is an external factor that depends on another individual. Um, and that is what I don't think a lot of people understand when they just put the logo there, right? Different perspectives, different understandings. Um, so yeah, I think that is kind of like a very important thing that I wanted to, to raise there as well. I mean, ultimately, I think, uh, any organisation that wants to grow positively in society has to take on these conversations and understand also that, that you know the richer your workforce, the the better your workspace essentially, your right. and your productivity and everything. If you've got happy happy employees, and then your your productivity is going to be much better. So so you know start training training managers is really really important. You know that no manager should be asking anyone why were you off sick. It's, it's none of their business. You know, so that's like a training issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, that that is vital. Just having people coming in and sharing experience like we're doing in work in, organi- in, in workspaces and in, in any kind of organisation that's got a public facing, um, you know, business, whether it's like, like I said, anything in the arts or whatever, wherever you're, you're in healthcare, whatever it is, people need training and yeah. to, to break down barriers and, and strip away the misconceptions. And actually question themselves as individuals because when people go to work, they put on this kind of suit it's and a mask. Yeah. Actually, we're all human beings underneath that. So it's always about tapping into the humanity. Um, I'm sure there are many, many things. And I was thinking about this and did scribble stuff down about what organizations could do. Um, yeah, asking people to, to label themselves like we all do now. It's very good Zoom manners. Ask people what's what's your how do you like to express yourself? Ooh. Is that me? Can you hear that? No, I think that's music. I'm sorry, it seems like my computer's decided to share some music. Damn. How weird. You can't hear that now. Can you hear that? Yeah, I can hear that. Eek. Was that me? I don't know. That's so odd. Okay. I can't well. see it in the chat, but that's okay. Okay, move on. Yeah, so we're all encouraged now to, to say what our pronouns are rather than people label us. That sort of thing is another thing that organisations could do to be more inclusive of mm-hmm. gender variants. Yeah, that's very true. I'm also aware of um, the, the questions in the chat. Do we have to answer them now or you want to do that later? Um, we will have time at the end um, to okay. answer the questions in the chat. Cool. Um, I'm just checking the other questions that we might have. Uh, yeah, how can organizations be inclusive to non-cisgender people? Well, yeah, I think um, I kind of like had that perspective and I also want to uh, focus on that as well. Um, how can organizations practice allyship? One, yes, you can put your logo there, um, but also what else? <laughs> Invite, invite the likes of you and me, and there are many of us who are willing to go and speak and share our experiences. That you is know, actually true. Yeah. For me, it's always about hu- back to humanizing people. As soon as there's an, you know, like someone's treated as different in some way, you know, then then that that's where the divisiveness comes in. Is if we want to be inclusive, it's about putting a human face to all these things that we think might be a bit weird or we don't understand it. Ask questions, find mm-hmm. out. You know, yeah, there is yeah, no yeah. Excuse. There is absolutely no excuse for ignorance in this day and age at all. Very true. You know, all That's the information true. is out there for everybody to find out. And we've got some, I've got some resources that I'm happy to stick into the chat for people to have a look at. And they're really, you know, they're, they're just really from organizations that are doing this work of, of looking at their policies and seeing how they can be inclusive and welcoming to everybody, you know, and recognize that humanity is a vast broad spectrum. It's not just this binary world that we're told. 
it is yeah it is. that's very mm -hmm. true i think yeah when it comes to allyship um i've seen a couple of forms of allyship that i prefer not to happen so i think there's also very let me just like i, I think i'm just going to share that when people speak on behalf of others or speak for others right so what we often what i've seen and this is also the reason why i started doing speaking engagements um is that they would then that we would have event that there would be events um and then they would invite a person who uh was white and gay a cisgender man to speak for the lgbt community and even though they know that they don't speak for the lgbt community there were some moments that they just did speak for the LGBT community. Um, and, you know, it was very much a lens um, from, you know, from privilege, you know, even though, yes, as a, you know, uh, a gay man, there is a, a loss of privilege that they have because there is a same sex, uh, you know, and there's this, the, the assumption uh, there, but they do still have privilege. They can still conform to what you said, the heteronormative. They still, they can still wear a suit and all is fine and they can perform and that's what you see often. Um, and often um, what then happens is that they speak on behalf of my lived experiences, but my lived experiences are so vastly different. And I was part of a training um, uh, or just like a, a speaking engagement. And towards the end, an individual said, yeah, the point, you know, at one point what we want is we do not want to have, they were talking specifically about network groups. At, at one point, we do not need to have specific groups and communities for people to exist in. Um, at one point, we don't have communities at all and everybody is living. And I was like, no, 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 that's not the point of inclusion. The point of inclusion is to have communities for any individual that might need it because every lived experience is super different. But again, this perspective of you know um a cisgender white gay white gay men um that it is a unconscious i want to say conscious and unconscious bias and assumption that that is the way forward that you know what often a lot of people say over 50 years everybody has a different color anyway so racism will be obsolete no that is that, that doesn't make any sense right it it everybody is going to have a different you know we're looking at specifically religion there's already a lot of different types of religions that we have um there are different types of uh, ways that we, people move through the world inclusivity is about creating and showing the importance of inclusivity and of communities that they should exist and all have the same um the same treatments um and the same way of them being respected and not another you know and that is i think very important um, and also, you know, like I said, when it comes to community within the organization, these are specifically network groups that organization can choose to uh, support. Um, what we often see or what has often been shown is um, that they don't then have to do it without a budget, right? So they have to figure out their ways of having pride during pride month and often the labor of having this is then put on the individual who is queer or trans within the within the company instead of it becoming a world, you know, a organizational um, 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 project, right? So these are the things that that I've definitely heard many people say that that is not, you know, where you so where you practice allyship is more than the pronouns in your bio. It is about okay, there is a project coming up. Yes, you are not going to speak on behalf of, but we do need people for newsletters. We do need people who can find don you know donate uh, donors. We do need people who is great who are great at I don't know creating posters. There are so many ways that you can utilize your skills in order to make sure that another organization or that 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 network group or um, the community can flourish within an organization, right? Um, and I think a lot of people often forget that because they think automatically activism and oh, and I'm like, no, 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 we just need your skills. You don't have to go with a banner of, if you want to, great. Um, but we also kind of need people behind the scenes. <laughs> you know, we need people who are good at having conversations um, and, and definitely utilize these skills. So those are the things that I, I definitely try to get people to understand a little bit better 
Um, and I do understand the the importance sort of that feeling, like you want to get out, you want to support, um, but also you do that simultaneously with having a good understanding of what these skills are first um, before diving straight into it. Um, I think, and I think those are the things that 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 I would definitely recommend. Um, uh, just utilizing your skills and the people that you have around it. Um, and sometimes you are, you can be a very silent contributor. That's kind of like how I want to how I phrase I want to phrase it: silent contributor to to equality. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you. People can always donate money also to to causes. You know, that unfortunately yeah. money still makes the world go round. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Thank you to you both um, for this so, this really rich discussion that you both had. It's Yes, I feel like I've just learned so much um, just from listening to you both. And I'm just looking at the chat and I can see a question that I feel um, leads off quite nicely from what you were saying, Z. Um, and so I'm just gonna read it out for you both, which is um, a lot of discourse, especially online is very combative. What are the best ways in your experience to create dialogue that supports people to unlearn um, and challenge their perspectives. Mm. What are the and best ways? I mean, I think this kind of forum's great. I think um, it's just, it feels slow, doesn't it? Having conversations feels slow. And I know what you mean, because I know several friends, you know, I've got friends who are, you know, white feminists who have got, you know, questions about gender and they've been shut down whenever then they've, they've, you know, people sort of shrink into not speaking because, you know, they might lose a job or they might, you know, be deplatformed. And, and I, I personally don't think that that's the way to go about um, winning friends and influencing people is to cut them off. I think you, you win hearts by, by having open conversations where people can share their experience rather than have their, quest their, their experiences questioned and undermined. And I, that, I think that works right across the board. Mm. I'm certainly not defending white feminists who, who, um, who might have uh, views that are excluding anybody per, per se, but I'm just saying that I would like to see more dialogue. Mm. I don't know if that answers the question because that feels like a really long, slow process. Yeah, I mean... Education, so people doing their research, you know? Yes that is what I want to start with. Yeah, I think there are two ways that we can, I think, look at this. Um, so when it comes to discourse, no, well, just seeing the world as it is right now, there is this sort of assumption that you have to choose a side, mm. right? And we have always been a right already in that there is this assumption that you have to choose a side, you're either for us or you're against us. And Pretty polarized very polarized and especially on social media where it's so much easier because you're behind the screen and you're typing and you can be anonymous whilst doing that which i find very sad and weak sometimes um you know there is this um it makes it more difficult right and i think the most important thing that i would definitely say is um start with the research i think that is that is one um and when it comes to um what I have done in the past because I've created created events. The most important thing is talking about it, it is the pre-work, right? So when you are, for example, creating an event or when you want to create a dialogue or you want to get people to have different perspectives, um, it is about doing the pre-work where you start with an idea of like, this is the conversation that I want to start with. Um, and naming all the things that um, you think might, you know, trickle or trick the other person or the dialogue to be steered from uh, a very fluid dialogue to a very binary dialogue, as in the very much yes versus no. Um, it is about doing the pre-work and saying, sp stating specifically, yes, we know that there are people who are against this. Yes, we know that there are people who are pro is. Um, but what we're not going to do, we're going to come together, but what we're not going to do is use either um, specific research that they found. They have to back up this, this research by if they're independent or not. They have to, you know, there's a sort of, a, I want to say, a 
I'm not being very clear. Um, there's a framework that you have to create first before you want to create this dialogue. That's what I wanted to say. Um, so it's really important that you have these these frameworks first. Um, and boundaries are very important to set up, right? Especially when you're doing it in a discussion forum and a discussion setting, because people are going to be triggered. And often a lot of the um, the uh, the importance in this as well is understanding when people get triggered through emotions or when people get triggered, be, or well, actually triggers all, all in emotion. Um, but the moment where people get triggered, how do you make sure that um, they can, um, they can back it up by either research or back it up by other lived experiences to, you know, make an argument. And I think what I've seen a lot, and we see this a lot, especially in the trans dialogue, the anti-trans dialogue is fear mongering. When a trans individual online or, you know, on, uh, on TV says, you know, well, actually talking about trans inclusivity, um, even at school or at home can support uh, the mental health um, for all individuals and they know exactly where they are, people automatically go to, yeah, but what about, you know, a block, you know, a hormone blockers for children. And I was like, no, but that is a false understanding because hormone blockers, kids need to be 12, 13, 14 before they go on hormone blockers. They are not, they are not allowed to be children. As a child, you do not have hormones. You do not have, that doesn't exist. It is puberty, right? So there are a lot of, there's a lot of fear mongering that happens um, and this is not backed up by research, not at all. It is literally only emotion and true emotion and talking about kids and talking about mutilation and talking about all of these things. Oh, and what about, you know, oh, but the heightened testosterone. I've been on testosterone. I'm not, I'm, am I aggravated? Yes, but it actually makes me do a lot better work. It doesn't make me aggressive. Aggression means that it's internal. Right. It means that you have to calm yourself. It means that you have to rethink. These are all internal work that I do. That is responsibility for myself. So I think the pre-work is very much important there. I'm going on a tangent, but the pre-work is very important there. It's all about making sure that the safety is there for both the people who are pro or against it. Um, and then working from from that. I went on a tangent, but I hope that I've been able to answer your question um, in that sense. Um, thank you, Sue. Um, that everything you said was useful. Um, never feel like there was a tangent that wasn't useful. Um, thank you. Um, and just to everybody in the audience, please do feel free to put any questions in the chat for our speakers to answer. Um, and I'm just going to read out the next question um, that we've got here, which is, what are some of what are some aspects of gender and gender affirmation that you believe are overlooked in the development sector slash diaspora networks? What do you mean with gender affirmation? I just want to have a few that out there. Um, I don't know if this person would like to quickly pop something. Yeah, if you would just yeah, be able to. Just some clarification because I'm not quite sure what they mean by the, the development sector slash dias diaspora networks as well. Like it's very broad. Very broad. Like I'm going to assume, um, giving that SSAP is a diaspora group that works in development, they're coming at it from that angle, um, being familiar with our work, maybe. Um, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry. Just wanted to confirm. Yeah. Essentially, just that. Um, I think that. I was just wondering if you thought there were any um, specific um, issues that sort of relate to, you know, um, development, um, diaspora inclusion, things like that. And you know, and, and it's totally fine if it's not something necessarily on your radar. But whether you had an idea of any specific sort of aspects that you think typically are removed from development work, especially African development work? I mean, I don't, I don't know if this answers the question, but what it makes me think of is the, the fact that so much of Africa was colonized and that so much of the, the rhetoric around sexuality and gender that have existed since colonization is around what was, what was presented and what was foisted upon 
there's people which they've now kind of adopted quite wholeheartedly um, and is still being fed by the sort of fundamentalist religions that keep pushing the agenda. And I would like to see more inclusion of, of or returning back to kind of more traditional what existed before the colonizers arrived and um, for people to for us all to be reminded or to be educated about what there was mm. for the interaction yeah. i think um i was part of this panel also with sasap and oh i forgot their name um but they somebody said something so brilliant they're a lawyer i'm assuming in south africa i don't know for sure and they said something along the lines of um, we were talking about anti-LGBT laws, legislation within the, you know, the, on the African uh, continent. Um, and they said, in order for a law to exist, people have to exist. And I was blown by that, right? So in order for an anti-LGBT law to exist, LGBT people have to exist. You cannot create a law without people, right? That is how it works. So and it really, you know, and I've, I've went back to to um, to what they said, and it's it, it that is true, right? And if we dive into, you know, and I think the colonial perspective um, is very important there, um, having an understanding of of uh, the pre, you know, pre colonial understanding of gender and gender fluidity, but even now in certain. Um, areas in the world, if we look specifically at, the, for example, Dominican Republic is one of the few countries that actually allows now gender X passports. And the reason why they allow gender X passports is because they have a heightened group of intersex individuals within their, within their, um, um, within their country, right? So when we are thinking about the understanding of gender and specifically also I'm including here in sex and trans gender individuals, but also in sex, because we're talking about, uh, you know, the assumed female at birth, the assumed male at birth, we're skipping a whole group of individuals who, according to Amnesty, was 1.7% of the population in the world is intersex, which is the same people of the same amount of people who have red hair. So we know that red, you know, we know about that for, for people with red hair, but we do not know about intersex individuals. And often these intersex individuals are in non-white um, countries. And again, I do not want to speak on, you know, for, on behalf of them, but I think it's important to have this conversation and include them in these conversations and in these dialogues that when we are creating or talking about the development of um, pretty much anything, looking at the laws and understanding why these laws were created, is it for LGBT or is it not for LGBT? Is it for mothers, i.e., you know, parental, let me just think parental policies, or is it not? Who gets to leave there, right? We are talking about simply, now we're, of course, we're diving into LGBT uh, law here, but I'm talking about general, general laws, Right? I'm talking about general who is allowed to embrace their full humanity and who isn't. And I think this is the conversation that we need to have when, um, when we are talking about specifically the continent of, of Africa. Um, or these are the things that I've definitely been, been thinking about. Um, and unfortunately, you know, yes, they were stripped, people were stripped from the African continent of Africa. Um, but I saw another beautiful quote, and I do not remember where 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 I got it from, but they said um, what gender nonconforming individuals and trans individuals show is ancestral memory. What I am showing, what Linda is showing is ancestral memory. It is not, it has nothing to do with laws. It has nothing to do with gender binary. It has nothing to do with the West. It is literally something that they couldn't take. And I think much more people, especially the Gen Zers, are understanding this, you know? So I know that they this, this is not a direct uh, response to your question, um, but yes, a lot of it dives into uh, the history. Um, and, but, you know, we also have the understanding of how law influences the individuals as well. Well, and, and you're absolutely right. We exist, right? We exist for whether there's a law or not, the humans, <laughs> we exist. And we have existed forever. So clearly we're part of There's nature and part there. of life and we're supposed to be here. <laughs> no. No. So, yeah. 
I'd like to, I'd like to see that more more inclusion in in any of the development sector or all the sectors really, and just an acceptance that life is full of variety and that's what makes life so rich and joy. You know, it'd be really boring for all the same. <laughs> True. Very and true. on that note, I want to say thank you so much to both of you, Z and Linda. We really, really appreciate this discussion that you both have had and shared with us. Um, thank you to everybody who has joined. Um, we do have a quick poll, which we would really appreciate um, if uh, all the attendees uh, could feedback on. Um, this will just help us to improve our event and let us know um, what people would like to see. Um, thank you so much. I know both of you mentioned that you had resources that you wanted to share. Um, please feel free to uh, put that in the chat, um, but also uh, send that to me and I will also disseminate that um, to all the attendees if possible. Thank you very much for having us. I really enjoyed the conversation with you, Z. Yeah, thank it's you. Great. I mean, it's an important conversation to have. And yeah, thanks for SVP for, for creating this this as well. Uh, and thanks for everyone joining. I hope it was, um, I hope it, it provided a different perspective at least uh, and answered some questions. Uh, let's stop the room here. Thanks so much. I'm just going to give everybody a moment to uh, fill the poll. Are we supposed to answer it as well? I mean, I feel like, you know, you could, sure. May, may, maybe might be biased, but, you know, go ahead. <laughs> Was it brilliant? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic speakers. <laughs> The rest of my stuff there. Yeah, just put some for people who are interested in, in when it comes to trans uh, inclusion. Um, I put gender and intelligence there. I don't know if people are aware of that, but there's a grassroots organization doing amazing work as well. Thank you for all those links. I am saying mine, mine are fairly basic because they're kind of aimed at you know anybody and everybody you know, uh, including including young people. That is exactly what we want. That and elders, you want. know, who this is all very odd and weird to. <laughs> well, that's making an assumption because there were lots of elders <laughs> who were like, you know, who were also gender non-conforming. Yes, a lot of people were actually transitioning later in life that we're finding as well, which is great because that means that they're finally allowed to be themselves. Yes, okay. So thank you to everybody um, who's filled out the poll. We really appreciate um, everyone's attendance and thank you once again to our amazing speakers. Uh, this has been fantastic having you both here. Um, and uh, thank you all.